I'm John Buchanan, and in this video, we're going to have a look at chroma verb. Now, there are two approaches that we can take to applying reverb to the sounds that we use within our projects. Space Designer uses what's called convolution reverb, recordings of real spaces, which can then be applied or convolved onto the sounds within your projects. And chroma verb is what's called an algorithmic reverb plugin. It uses synthesis style parameters to approximate a space, giving you lots of control but sort of a sound design approach to building a space that works perfectly for the sounds within your track. Let's hear the track before we start adding reverbs to it. Okay, I'm going to start by focusing on the beat loop, which is the last track down here. Let's just put a loop around it. So what I'm going to do is to add chroma verb to this project. You're going to find it obviously in Logic's reverb uh, options. You're going to find it in Logic's reverb options, which are down here. And here is chroma verb right at the top of the list. And we obviously want the stereo instance of it. So here is chroma verb. Now, the first thing to say is that chroma verb features a number of different sort of starting points for the sounds that you want to use, giving you different groups of parameters based around different types of spaces. So we can see here that we have rooms and chambers and concert halls, and then we have some ones that are a little bit more esoteric, one called digital, one called dense, one called airy. But all of these are effectively different algorithmic starting points for the kind of sound that you might want to build. So you can choose something that feels appropriate. For my drum sound, I'm gonna start with something that's maybe a little bit more like a chamber than a room. And once I've made that selection, I can just click out of here and come back to the main display. Now within Chromover, we've got two pages of parameters. We have the main page here, and then we have a details page, which we'll come to in a moment. And the main feature in the upper section of the main page is what's called a damping EQ. What we've got is four separate filters, two bell curves. Think of it like an EQ. We've got two separate bell curves and then two shelves, which are going to roll out or introduce more of different frequency groups. And effectively, what we're doing here is we're changing the relationship between the decay time and specific frequencies. I'll show you what I mean. When I press play, what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate this upper band here. This is the high shelf. And when I manipulate this, what we're going to hear is that we're changing the decay rate of this upper frequency area. So what you can hear there at the top is that the upper frequencies of the drum loop, when we reduce that, they're not just getting quieter, they're getting shorter. And when we push it, they're not just getting louder, they're getting longer. So effectively what we can do is we can kind of bias the relationship between a particular frequency area and the relationship that it has with the reverb in that frequency area. So we have the upper shelf here, the lower shelf down here at the bottom, and then these two bell curves which are here. And what we can do you can see is manip manipulate these points directly within the interface, or you can see that they correspond to these parameters underneath. A ratio of one is a flat line uh, right in the middle of the interface. And what we can effectively do is then to create ratios either below one, which are obviously going to shorten uh, the decay time, or above one, which is going to increase it from the default sort of value. So that hopefully makes sense so far. What we then got down at the bottom is a, another sort of set of parameters, which again, maybe we might associate a little bit more almost with synthesizers as much as we would with reverbs. We have an opportunity to control the attack time of the way that the sound uh, sort of blooms and, and, um, and sort of blossoms. And then what we have a chance to do is to choose its overall size and its density. These are approximations of the way that the sound interact with this kind of virtual space we're building for it. We also have a decay time, the overall reverb length, and a sort of a distance from us to the source sound, the drum loop in this case, which we're in a position to manipulate as well. So I'm going to press play and we'll have a listen to some of these parameters as, um, uh, as we play back.
So we can hear that there are some really key components there that are changing. And we've also got a sort of pre-delay option, which is down here as well, which basically sets a pause between the sound triggering and then the reverb being triggered as well. So let's take these back to some slightly more sensible um, intermediate settings before looking at the second page. So this is the main damping EQ page on the main uh, page here up in the top right hand corner. And if we select details next to it, this page is dominated primarily by the output EQ. Now this is a much more conventional EQ. This allows me to set a sort of tonal timbral response of the reverb that I'm generating within Crowverb. So in other words, if at this point I suddenly decide that actually there's too much bass in the uh, reverb solution which has been generated, then obviously I'm in a position to engage the filter here at the bottom um, and just to sort of roll out the frequency content that I want to. So again, similarly, I might decide that maybe something in the middle is a little bit sort of over um, exposed and I want to just rein it in or I want to tame frequencies at the top end. Again, the output EQ will allow me to do that and it behaves much like the channel EQ in terms of allowing you to set um, the uh, the areas that you want to work on. And we've got a bandwidth control here which allows us to either go for sort of general overall changes or much more surgical ones around a particular frequency if we want to. And then down at the bottom what we also have is a chance to set something interesting in terms of modulating the way that this reverb behaves. Now, in order to do this, what I'm actually going to do is to show you another one of the um, uh, algorithms here. I'm going to choose dense and I'm going to dive back into the details page and we'll begin to see what happens. So what I've got here is a modulator and what this is going to do is to add movement and unpredictability to the reverb and the way that it responds. And we'll hear that really clearly, particularly if I turn up the amount of depth. So this is controlling the speed of these little fluctuations, these sort of yeah, these, uh, these variations really in the way that the reverb is generated. And by turning up the mod depth, we should hear that relatively clearly. So this is nice. What it's doing is it's just sort of opening and closing the way that this sound behaves. And what you can see, and part of the reason why I selected this particular parameter is because whilst we have access to mod speed and mod depth within this particular algorithm, what we don't have a chance to do is to change the modulation source. And this is a really crucial thing to say about Chromaverb. All of these separate algorithms provide you with more or less control. They're not all the same. So it's really worth experimenting with the way that these um, sounds can behave. If we come back into here, for instance, and choose, let's say, the chamber again, go back to where we were, dive back into the details. This time, whilst we've retained our modulation speed and depth, what we also have a chance to do is to slightly manipulate the way in which those modulation changes are going to happen. Whereas before we had a fixed response to that, this time we can either choose a, uh, a sine wave or something a little bit squarer, or again, we've got a more random shape here as well, which is just going to provide us with those, um, those undulations. And the reason why that matters so much is because what this is, is a really creative reverb. And depending on the source material that you're working on, it could be that actually different algorithms and different approaches to modulating the way that the reverb behaves will really bring those sounds to life. If you imagine a kind of retro synth pad, for instance, and you want something which is a little bit 80s, then something which is a lot of mod depth and maybe something with a sort of slightly more wonky approach to the way that that modulation is applied, not a sine wave that's kind of predictable, but something which just feels like it's kind of flitting in and out of tune might be a really interesting uh, sort of thing to, uh, to work with. Over on the left hand side, what we have a chance to do is to choose the quality of the reverb. Do you want something deliberately kind of lo-fi and gritty? Do you want something high quality or do you want ultra pristine reverb? Again, that's something that you can choose over here on the left. Might be quite interesting to experiment with the low option here just to hear some low, some deliberately low quality uh, reverb. Okay, that's particularly interesting right up at the high end where we almost get this kind of bit crushed effect on the top end when we select a kind of low frequency response, so it, it much less refined and airy. 
And what we've got over here um, towards the right hand side is um, uh, further parameters. We can set a balance between early reflections, the first little moments of reverb as a sound begins to be triggered and generated, or the kind of later reverb taps, so when the, the reverb is beginning to decay and we get a bit further into the way that it uh, responds, we can set a balance between those. Early reflections tends to be brighter and more clattery and late uh, sort of reflections are smoother and warmer and they tend to have a bit less top end in them. So that's worth experimenting with as well. And then we've got the opportunity to enhance the stereo width again as a means to either deliberately sort of uh, pare down the sort of reverb response of a sound or dramatically increase it, that width control can be really interesting. So what we're gonna do is to put the drum loop back into the track and experiment with a couple of the parameters here just to begin to see how we can kind of tailor this, um, this reverb to um, our project. Okay, I like that. So what we've got is a slightly early biased um, sort of reflection uh, balance with the sort of late taps. I've gone for a sort of low quality uh, reverb. So we're deliberately rolling out some of that top end and we've slightly decreased the width as well so that the whole drum sound becomes a bit more contained. But I've retained quite a lot of modulation depth there so that we just get these little offsets, just something a little bit unpredictable happening in the reverb decay. So within this video, what we've done is to take a slightly closer look at Chromaverb. We've only looked at a couple of the algorithms, but you can begin to see that lots of the parameters are common from one to the next. What we've got are two main pages, a main uh, one actually called the main page up here in the top right hand corner, which allows us to set um, a relationship between frequency content and how that gets damped over time as well as being able to set sort of global controls down here at the bottom. And then we've got a details page where we've got an overall output EQ, the opportunity to increase modulation or introduce modulation into our sounds, as well as choosing the overall quality of the reverb and a couple of other parameters here as well to set the balance between early and late reflections and to spend some time thinking about how stereo and wide we want our sounds to be. Chromaverb is, as I say, the algorithmic reverb within Logic. Unlike Space Designer and its convolution approach, this is almost a sort of synthesizer for reverb.